A reading from hymn 562. As by one man all mankind fell, and born in sin was doomed to hell, so by one man who took our place, we are all justified by grace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So there we have it. Right in front of our face. For this Sunday after Trinity, the law. Right there, right in front of our faces. There's no getting out of it. There's no getting around it. In fact, the only way to get through it is to face it. Now, that is for the Christian. For those who do not abide faithfully in the faith, we can, they can sort of weave in and out of these things. And for Christianity as well, I think that we can do that also. We can weave ourselves in and out of the Ten Commandments. We can try bobbing and weaving and putting, well, these, these sins are worse than these sins, and I don't do this sin, but that guy does, and he's the worst. That kind of thing. But when we look at the Ten Commandments, we have to look at the Ten Commandments full in the face. Are any of, have you not broken any of these? And I know the quick answer is, yes, we've, we've broken all of them. But what does that mean? I think about this at least once a day, if not twice a day. What does it mean to actually stand in front of the law of God and actually see how deeply we break these laws? I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Because of that, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself carved images or anything in likeness that is, a, that is in heaven above or earth beneath. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Now, when we read it that way, and we look at the law, and we go, well, at least I haven't killed anybody. So, and tell me if I'm wrong, because I think we've all done this, each and every one of us. So basically, I'm a pretty good guy. I haven't killed anybody. I haven't stolen anything. That's for those guys. That's for those sinners. I haven't bared false witness against our neighbor. I haven't wanted things that my neighbor has, or maybe not wanted, is that wanted is not the right word, but actually coveted, tried to take away from our neighbor. I mean, we don't do that, right? I mean, and we love our God, don't we? Sure, of course we love our God, because our God first loved us. It makes complete sense. But then I ask you this question, and this question hits me to the heart every single time I ask it for myself. We say that we love our God, but what do you spend most of your time doing? There's your item. What do you put your heart into? There's your idol. And I don't have to say what, what that thing is or what those things are because you know it. I know it. I know it about myself, I mean. <laughs> I know what my, what my idols are and I try to break them down daily. 
But we do. The, the, the truth is, is that we do put other gods, lowercase gods, before our God. And we have murdered one another with our tongues. We have committed adultery with that second glance. We have stolen against our neighbor, be it, if not material gains, then certainly stolen uh, from them in other ways. We bear false witness against our neighbor. It's almost as common to us as any other reflex. Coveting things, certainly part of our nature. So here's the reality of the law. We're stuck. We face the law, and when we look at the law, this is how sinful that we are. When we look at the law, we even, instead of saying, we are bad, and the law says that we are bad, we instead say, law, bad, gospel, good. Because it's more convenient. But here's the truth. The law keeps us curved, just like any other curve. It keeps us on the path. It is a mirror, and it is not a mirror meant to be held up and admiring yourself, but one to see all of your flaws, imperfections, and sins. Put the mirror down, and we have the third use of the law, the path that the Holy Spirit takes us down to help and love our neighbor. That's the uses of the law. No one can keep this law perfectly, but... It has to be kept perfectly. If it is not kept perfectly, there can be no salvation. The law has to be fulfilled. And so we look at it, and there's only one thing that we can do. We are out in the ocean, no boat around, no way of being saved. We're going to drown in our sins according to the law. And then a gracious God comes along, reaches into that water, pulls you out, and says, that law, I fulfilled that. I did that. I did that for you. You have transgressed, but I died for you have the forgiveness of sins because I am the forgiveness of sins. That water that you so drowned it in is not as so much out in the ocean, but is in the font. There your transgressions lay. Remember, make the sign of the cross. Remember your baptism. Remember that our Lord Jesus Christ loved you enough that He Himself would die and from His side would come blood to the altar and water to the font and that as you wash and as you feed in Him, you have the salvation and the entire law is kept. But it's kept on your behalf. It's by Christ's merit that He keeps the law. And it is by His merit that you also keep the law. We keep the law in Christ just as much as we keep the faith in Christ. And as long as we keep the faith in Christ, then we have this to be absolutely true. And every night we go to bed, we are buried. And every morning we wake up, we are resurrected. And we are resurrected in this. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ, were baptized into His death. We were buried, therefore, with Him into baptism, into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. Does that sound familiar to anyone? It's in the Bible, I know, but does that particular phrase kind of ring true? I've heard that somewhere before. Where is that thing? Two places. It is said to the baptized before they are baptized. It's read to the holy congregation of God. And then it's read when they put the pall over your casket. And from the time you're baptized until the time you die, and I said, and I use those words on purpose because once you're baptized, you are always baptized, even into heaven. 
From the time you're baptized to the time you die, you live in baptismal grace. And in that baptismal grace, that water that washes you in the faith into Jesus Christ, that has kept the law on your behalf, that baptismal water it soaks in the tablets of the law. And there we are justified and sanctified. Because Christ Himself, God Himself, that same benevolent Lord who walked and dragged you out of drowning in the water also says to you today, this law, this law that you cannot keep and that breaks your heart, I have kept and I mend today. Amen. And now may the peace which surpasses all human understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus now and forever. Amen. Amen.